Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort, a local Champaign-Urbana peace group. I'm Carl Estabrook. My guest tonight is our favorite Republican, Ed Mandel. We're recording this at noon on Tuesday, June 12th, in the studios of Urbana Public Television. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing. In accord with the Latin proverb, proprium humane and geni est odesse cum laserus, it's human nature to hate those you have injured. While the president is talking peace in Singapore with the leader of North Korea, the U.S. is making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Mideast and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a we weapon against its economic rivals from Germany to China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, although most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command are active in three quarters of the countries of the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. As the rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. today is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protected as they are by government and media propaganda. What we do here at Aware on the Air is try to encourage our fellow citizens to oppose U.S. government killing around the world. Two notes in the news, uh, in addition to the major news, which Ed and I will get to eventually. Uh, first of all, Militants in Syria, militants backed by U.S. forces, are reported to plan to stage another chemical attack, a false flag operation. Militants of the so-called Free Syrian Army, jihadists supported by the U.S. and attacking the Syrian government, militants of the so-called Free Syrian Army, with the assistance of U.S. military special operations forces, are mulling a fake chemical attack in Syria. This intelligence was confirmed by three independent channels in Syria, said the Russian Defense Ministry. The Free Syrian Army militants, who are said to be staging this operation, have brought chlorine cylinders to a settlement in the Syrian province of Deir al-Zur to fake a chemical attack by the Syrian government troops against civilians. A video of the stage attack after it's disseminated in the Western media, will serve as a new pretext for the U.S.-led coalition, in Syria illegally as they are, to strike Syrian targets and justify an offensive by militants against Syrian government forces on the eastern bank of the Euphrates River. All of this uh, is occurring, of course, under the radar, uh, which is concentrating on things going on in Asia. The Ministry of Defense of Russia said it's intolerable to use such a provocation to destabilize Syria, and that seems quite true. The United States, along with Britain and France, launched joint airstrikes on military targets in Syria two months ago in response to what they said was the Syrian military's use of chemical weapons in Douma, a then rebel-held town near the Syrian capital of Damascus. However, Russia says that no trace, traces of the chemical attack in April had been found and that the event was staged. There are now reports that these U.S.-backed jihadists are about to try it again. So watch the news in the next week or so. Page 2, Yemen. Hodeida, Yemen's major port, which receives 80% of the country's food imports, is threatened with imminent military attack by the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. The UAE gave aid groups three days to leave Hodeida, 
before the threatened launch of this operation, putting 250,000 people under the immediate threat of being killed and millions more at risk of starving to death. Even a, Was a recent Washington Post editorial opposed such a Saudi UAE, UAE, United Arab Emirates, assault, warning that the world's worst humanitarian crisis could get even worse. The paper argued that the U.S., which supplies the Saudi U UAE alliance with arms, targeting intelligence, refueling of Saudi bombers during their bombing runs, and diplomatic protection at the U.N., should use its leverage to stop this reckless venture. This is from the Washington Post, which supports the warmongering of the U.S. government. The Pentagon has been deeply dishonest with Congress and the American people about the depth of the U.S. role in enabling this catastrophic war, which has never been authorized by Congress, in direct violation of the War Powers Clause of the Constitution and of the War Powers Resolution of 1973. The New York Times reported that U.S. Army Special Forces have been directly involved in anti-Houthi military operations, blatantly contradicting Pentagon claims that the U.S. is, quote, not directly involved, close quote. There's no question that Washington could stop the catastrophic UAE assault on Hodeidah if Washington saw it as a priority to do so. As Oxfam America notes, if the U.S. fails to stop the attack, it will own the consequences. Please urge your representative and senators to join congressional representatives Mark Polkin, Justin Amish, Ro Khanna, Thomas Massey, Barbara Lee, Walter Jones and Ted Liu, Democrats and Republicans, in demanding that Defense Secretary James Mattis act to stop the catastrophic Saudi assault on Hodeidah by signing a petition at change.org or at the website Just Foreign Policy. You're watching Aware on the Air. We're talking about news that is not making headlines, and we'll get to the headlines before long. Uh, the headlines, of course, are in Asia. Peace is at hand in Asia because uh, of the presence, I think, largely, of Dennis Rodman, the NBA yeah. star, yes. uh, who arrived. And I will say that at least the administration uh, seems to agree with me. Uh, Sarah Huckabee, uh, the press secretary to President Trump, called Dennis Rodman uh, while the conference was going on between the leader of North Korea and the President of the United States and thanked Dennis for his work in maintaining the connections between the U.S. and North Korea. Well, the U.S. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt your flow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the deal reached by President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is essentially the double freeze proposed by China and Russia at the UN and elsewhere for some time. The opposition to the deal comes from the Democrats, the Clinton campaign, and the neocons. This should give us pause. Amazing how partisan politics shape this country's foreign policy. Seven Democratic senators have written the president urging that any agreement signed with North Korea must be permanent, must be subject to anywhere, anytime, their phrase, inspections of all nuclear-related sites and facilities, and must include the dismantling and elimination of all the regime's ballistic missiles and programs. One thinks of uh, Secretary of State Pompeo's demands on Iran to renegotiate the Iran deal by making infinite concessions, by mm -hmm. calling on them to make infinite concessions. Mm -hmm. It's a tit for, tit for tat for the solid Republican opposition to the Iran nuclear deal in 2015. Five of the seven senators, our own Senator Durbin, Warner, Feinstein, Leahy, and Brown, had voted for the Iran agreement while two, Schumer and Menendez, had been among a mere four Democrats, two expressing devotion to Netanyahu, vote against it. So this is a display of democratic unity towards the end, not of bringing permanent peace to the Korean Peninsula, but to make it as difficult as possible for an unpopular, beleaguered president, Mr. Trump, to score a diplomatic triumph, which could shift momentum of the Republicans in the interim election. 
Democrats are willing to torpedo the moves toward peace in North Korea in order to regain control of the House of Representatives. There are some Democrats, and some Republicans alike, praying for failure mm -hmm. in Singapore, yep. worried they imply about an ill-prepared, impetuous commander-in-chief giving up the family jewels <coughs> over bilgogi and kimchi, uh, local dishes, eh? At the same time, due to calculation, like Bolton, or dumbness, like Pence, top Trump administration officials, plus his personal lawyer Giuliani, have worked to sabotage the summit meeting by deliberately insulting Kim Jong-un and the DPRK, the party that runs North Korea, in the weeks leading up to it. The big picture is that the United States under Trump abruptly entered a period of aggressive exceptionalism involving unilateral withdrawal from treaties, provocation of trade wars, broadcast of insults against close allies, harsh measures against undocumented immigrants, and the imposition of discriminatory rules on Muslim enter Muslims' entry into the U.S., and a general tendency to reflect the sentiments of a benighted political base. Uh, we can argue exactly what that base is and whether the caricature is right. This has alienated Europe in general, as well as Mexico and Canada, the U.S. top trading partner, but this is no excuse for torpedoing the remarkable moves towards peace in Singapore. Meanwhile, it has positively alarmed many in the State Department, dominated by neocons, and in U.S. politics as a whole. The mainstream media incessantly attacks Trump's foreign policy. That is, the U.S. is in a situation that might be called, if you are, speak Japanese, Nayu Gai Khan, troubles within and without. This is how Japanese historians describe Japan in the early 19th century, when the regime of the shogun faced both internal dissent and weakness and challenges in foreign relations. In part, the latter result from a policy of what we might call isolationism. This period resulted in the toppling of the regime and the establishment of the regime that fought the Second World War. The U.S.'s external troubles now involve the fraying of alliances. Emmanuel Macron has actually suggested that the G7 should become the G6, with the U.S. absent. <laughs> the internal troubles include the Russia investigation, Trump's other legal problems, and the prospect of impeachment, massive disillusionment of youth by the very nature of the capitalist system, widespread if not universal contempt for Trump among women due to his manifest misogyny, widespread indignation, indignation uh, among African Americans, widespread opposition from Mexican Americans and other Hispanics due to Trump's crazy wall plan and related issues, and not least the president's inability as a manager to put together a disciplined team. Uh, Trump is, remarkably, one of the weakest presidents we've had recently. Part of the problem is the chaos which is Trump's mind is reflected in the, in the chaos in the White House West Wing, but the greater problem is that the political establishment is appalled that Trump is unwilling to continue the war provocations against Russia and China, or apparently he is, and that this is uh, driving the American political establishment nuts. In this context, seven Democratic senators, reflecting both external and external troubles, address the pres address the president demanding that any deal he makes with Kim meet unrealistic specifications for their approval. They obviously want to blow it up. They see the world they've known, American aggression around the world, toppling around them due to Trump's iconoclasm, and they want to do some smashing too. And because they feel no responsibility to the planet, but merely to their own re-elections, these Democrats abet the national decline relative to the world. Perhaps the only good thing the world sees in Trump is his unexpected openness to talks with North Korea. The prospect of a successful summit delights most people, including the leaders of China, South Korea, and Russia. 
that Feinstein, Senator Feinstein and company should already be throwing cold water on any results, show how out of touch they are with the world and how much they overestimate the extent of U.S. power. There seems to be a bipartisan embrace of idiocy. All the congressional bickering and the media's incessant harping on Trump, to the exclusion of attention to matters such as war in Yemen, Italian elections, mass protests against Macron's policies in France, horrible events in Gaza, Amnesty International's report on the obliteration of Raqqa, etc., are a cacophony of sounds as pathetic, pathetic as the strains of the Titanic ensemble as the ship went down. You hear in those sounds two bipartisan choruses of discordant voices get cumulatively tell the world, yes, we're sinking, but we don't know it or we don't care, and if it happens, we'll take others down. There is no principle or decency, but rather sheer opportunism from such Democrats. This could lead either to an apocalypse or to ongoing imperial decay. One must hope for the latter. That Right, right, but that, ar right. that remark, that uh, uh, article, slightly uh, edited. Uh, ad uh, edited by me, uh, comes from Gary Leup uh, on the Counterpunch website. Uh, Leup is a professor of history, of Japanese history, at uh, Tufts University. Uh, Ed, uh, what do you, yeah. what do you think? Inter inter <laughs> interesting interesting yes, weekend, huh? Well, let, me, let me ask you a question. Do, do Democrats support... Um, um, you know, they, they actually supported Hillary. It was more imperial. It was imperialist. I mean, yeah, of course. But they, 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 they support. They support the war. I mean, here, I mean, here, Trump is what is, is trying to negotiate. And, uh, yeah. And uh, I, I was going to. I mean, uh, there are some uh, um, people who are conservatives who are comparing Trump with Lincoln. I, I would say I'm more about comparison between Trump and Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he, he does want to rebuild the military. But I, th I think he's he's going in it, but way before earlier than the military industrial complex, the whole um, having conflicts all over the country, all over the world, and, and, and everything. And I think he's he's trying to he's, he is trying to you know was it carry a big sting and to speak softly and carry the not, not, well, I mean, mm -hmm. his version of carry, speaking softly. <laughs> Let me a brief just a brief comment on that. I know you have other things that you tweet, want tweet to develop on. Tweet softly, but, <laughs> yeah, tweet softly. That's right, and carry carry a big stick. Yeah, 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 yeah go. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, the comparison with uh, uh, Lincoln and Roosevelt, I think, uh, yeah. makes sense only if we take some effort to try to say how different Lincoln and Roosevelt actually are from their popular images in this yes. country, and that would take us probably further afield. Right. Uh, but it's the I, I will point out that the president I've been comparing Trump to okay. uh, is Calvin Coolidge. Uh, okay. the, perhaps one of the weakest presidents of the 20th century, well, given the fact that uh, in spite of uh, their difference in style, Coolidge was known as Silent Cal, yes, he was. and no one will ever, will ever call uh, uh, Trump Silent Don, right? No, uh, but, uh, but in spite of the difference in style, the, the weakness of the presidency in both administrations um, uh, seems to be under the bluster, uh, the real parallel. Now, that's why the events of this weekend are so shocking. Uh, the neocons, the Democrats, uh, the uh, neocons in the Republican Party, um, the Clinton campaign, all of these folks have from the beginning been appalled at the suggestion that uh, Donald Trump would not be down with the program of neoconservatism and neoliberalism right. followed by the previous administration. Now, they really haven't had much to worry about except right. things Trump said in the campaign. It, nothing to worry about in terms of what he's actually done up to this weekend. Actually, and now suddenly something's happened. Actually, I don't mind you comparing him with Calvin Coolidge. I have a much more uh, favorable view of Calvin Coolidge <laughs> than you do. And I don't see, it as, see him as weakness, though. Uh -huh. well, but I, I do see him as being much being, being decisive in certain ways than, mm -hmm. than, than previous presidents were. Uh -huh. So I, I, I don't see him, and I don't see it as weakness, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it, I don't know if I, I should just leave it there in, in saying that I'm, I mean, there are certain aspects of, of, of Trump which I think are, are tremendous. I mean, 
I, I think he was making some some very bold moves, and and and, and I, I think his what, what 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 people consider his erratic behavior is actually part of the part of his manner, it is as part of his style, to, to, to keep people guessing of where he's going to be going, and while he while he seems to know and keep keeping his options open, if you will. Well, there's certainly. Uh evidence from this weekend that would uh, suggest that your interpretation, unlikely as it sounds to me, uh, may be true. Uh, yeah. Because this, this, this is important, and uh, I, think, I think the most important thing about it is less what Trump has done, important as that is, as to what it shows about the settled belligerence of the American political establishment, that they could be so shocked, so appalled, by a political arrangement that avoids war in Korea. Uh, that, that, that's the real scandal, it seems to me, not anything well, Trump and, has done. And, and determined to have that, in, in, in just, just to, have to make sure that, the, that Trump loses his power exactly. in, in November and in, in, in 2020, I guess the next thing before he will be reelected. I don't understand that at all because, I mean, wow, really? Well, You're willing to risk nuclear war just, just to, just, you know, just to, just to you know, win elections? Really? Wow. Really? I think it's that's understandable perfect. only if we begin to understand what the real policy of the United States actually is in terms of uh, international relations, foreign policy, uh, that the imperialist actions of the United States in Asia uh, are not being uh, uh, continued by this administration is scaring the uh, political establishment to death. Well, and uh, they, uh, uh, you know, let me ask the, you the long-term policy of the United States has been what the Pentagon calls offshore control of China. Right. That is controlling the uh, economic life of China uh, by, uh, by controlling the sea. Uh, and China is breaking out of that by the Belt and Road in initiatives, with the, which you, the U.S should be involved in, should be joining, should be cooperating, but instead is promoting uh, nothing short of war in order to try to stop it. The containment of China, the containment of Eurasia, has been the bedrock of American foreign policy for more than a century. And the, uh, w the threat of Trump was always that he would abandon some aspect of that policy, as in fact he's done in regard to North Korea this weekend. That's just what the political establishment has been afraid of, uh, and here it is before them in all its uh, in all its glory. I don't think they mentioned it in this article you just mentioned just now, but the Democrats are going to the right of Bolton. Oh sure. I, 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 I get actually this article, yes. article you just read just did mention that, but yeah. I mean yeah, I, it's kind of interesting that. I mean, I, would you say that, that Trump is, is maybe perhaps the first president to actually, I don't know if he's actually actually listened to uh, Eisenhower's farewell speech, but would you say he's the first president to consider um, um, challenging the military industrial complex, even though he's building, he is building it up, but the, the, uh, yeah. usage, but the usage of that military in, in, in actively, would you say he's the first president to actually consider it? I think that may be overstated. I mean, yeah. the military industrial complex uh, and that we've been talking about in this country yeah. at least since the Eisenhower administration yes. um, is a settled fact of American government. Right. It's the institutional analysis of American government uh, allows us to get away from the notion of uh, well what did Trump say, what did Kennedy say, what did uh, this or that president say yeah. and look at what the American uh, political uh, establishment has done in the interests not of Americans at large, mm -hmm. but in the American uh, in the interests of the American political elite. That's the story that needs to be told, and that's the story that is obfuscated, covered over, uh, ignored, uh, more than ignored, hidden uh, by the American uh, system of media and propaganda, uh, which works so well. Uh, the American establishment, the American economic elite, is only really afraid of one enemy, and that enemy is the American public. So we have a system of this country of uh, uh, plutocracy, which means that every now and then there has to be a great propaganda effort on the part of that elite 
to convince the rest of the country that uh, their rule should continue. Their fear was that Trump represented a, a crack in the wall, that Trump represented a um, perhaps breach of that uh, system of control and convincing people uh, that uh, uh, had worked so well so far. And I think we see we, we, we see, see a Trump's result of effort that. To, to do this in Korea is almost like uh, it's effort to reach back in time and end or at least challenge the and begin the end of the North of the Korean conflict, which is, is it well, been ongoing since 19, 1950, since before I guess before even before he was born. <laughs> they're specifically they're specifically talk about that, and it's interesting yeah. as a sidelight to this. And also as an as an effort, I'm on. I want to thank, thank you for your thought here. But also uh, and also for him to, to gain an advantage over China in the trade in, in the supposedly trade war. So that I'm yeah. So the, 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 these things are like merging together somehow. But go ahead. I'm, 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 well, the relationship with China is important here. Whether it's really an advantage over China or not, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. But it's it's certainly true that the U.S. Uh, uh, belligerence towards North Korea and this uh, apparent deal that's been worked out this weekend are both involved with China in the background, as the Korean War itself was. It was, of course, China, which uh, lost perhaps a million people uh, to the uh, in the U.S. assault on Korea in the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, now that, uh, if it's remembered at all by Americans, um, is uh, remembered as uh, American defense against communist subversion, uh, the same thing that took us into Vietnam, if you, according to the standard account. Right. Uh, the standard account is, is a flat lie. Uh, if you look at what the United States actually did in the second half of the uh, 20th century, what it was doing in East Asia was defending, in a sense, the economic control of the region that it had gained from defeating Japan in the Second World War. Now, I've been talking on this program, Ed, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I may not uh, uh, be uh, as uh, clear about it as perhaps uh, one could be, <laughs> mm -hmm. because uh, what the U.S. has done for more than a century uh, is uh, concerned itself with what was called in 1899 the open door policy. Okay. The open door was a policy uh, that the United States enforced against the other imperialist powers to make sure that the American economic elite could continue to exploit Eurasia without being excluded by the other imperialist powers or eventually by uh, the, the, the inhabitants of Eurasia themselves, Russia and China. What's happened recently, and by recently I mean the last uh, uh, 50 years, um, <laughs> but what's happened recently is a challenge to that long-term uh, policy uh, that really began with the major political event from the, in terms of American foreign policy uh, in the century, and that was the loss of China. That is, the success of the Chinese Revolution in 1949 came as a surprise yeah. to the United States and as a threat to its control of East Asia, its control of Eurasia. Uh, and the, a great deal uh, of uh, American policy afterwards can be seen as an attempt to reverse that reversal in 1949. Mm -hmm. The classic accounts of this can come from the major American um, foreign policy writers uh, who kept put a positive uh, interpretation on this. I'm thinking of Zbigniew Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger, both of whom uh, are give an account of how the U.S. has got to impose peer competitors in Eurasia. Peer competitors are people who are on the same level as the United States, economically, we're speaking, economically and military, uh, in, in economic and military terms. Uh, the U.S. Uh, fears and has to prevent the rise of peer competitors, people who can contend with the U.S. economically and politically in Eurasia. And of course there are two, Russia and China. Yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the situation in which the U.S. is working and various discussions of the defense of freedom and uh, freedom of navigation, as we've been saying recently in the South China, is window dressing, it's lies, it's nonsense. What the U.S. is doing here is dealing with 
the decline, the long-term decline of its economic control of the world, which was established by the Second World War. And here we are today. Well, I can't deny that I mean that the United States has been exploiting other countries. What am I supposed to say? I mean, I, I guess that I guess they've been doing that for for quite a long time. And exactly. I, I, I just, I, not my decision, but there it is. Mm -hmm. there, it's sort of like you know whatever. I just don't right. want to say it. Um, I will say that I mean I I, I do I, I do agree with you that I mean Dennis Rodman I mean, going back in time here we gotta get Dennis Rodman's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah going back to Korea again I mean yeah yes you sort of like um, the, the unofficial negotiator unofficial double diplomat for the United States there <laughs> uh, I I think it's rather interesting that uh, yeah he uh, in fact. Uh, suggested to a lot of people that uh, you know and the reason why these I were is, is human I, I, beings we were dealing with. And I'm, I'm wondering if if if, if Hillary, had Hillary Clinton won, would she have supported someone like uh, Rodman's effort, or would, would she would she have said no, stop yeah. that? No, I, I, and then, I, whereas I, Trump, I think, I think right. is going in the exact opposite direction. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. I think it's very interesting because I, I don't think she would have been open to it at all. You're. Uh, Luckily, I think, uh, we won't have to deal with that anymore, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, it, we certainly will de have to deal with the political establishment that nominated uh, Hillary Clinton and expected her to be president. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are uh, undermining whatever advances have been made now uh, by President Trump in regard to Korea. No oh, no, question. right now, the, uh, right now she's, she's, she's still, even though she lost the election, she's still much and very much in, in control of the party. Or at uh, least 20, 20, her people are. I don't, 20, 20, I, I, I have trouble sometimes saying, is it this yeah. person or is it that person? Oh, yeah, right. But the institution, right. the institution that produced the Clinton campaign, that's still there. And those people are there. I got into an argument this week uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, involved um, Seth Rich. Oh, okay. And uh, really? the, questions, the questions about what the Clinton campaign actually has done uh, oh, yeah. and in various places, that's... Yep. Uh, that's important. Yes, it is. But that's not really about what the United States is doing, I think, in the world at large, except as an indication of what the American political establishment uh, is uh, capable of. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually think that we are looking at, at a red wave in, in November. I, I, I think the Democrats are, are positioning themselves, position themselves as being, no matter what Trump says, we're against it. And I, 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 th yep. I, think, I, th I think that's a better, that's really, really bad, bad strategy. I mean, they need to come up with their own, their own the plan, and I, I think they're just uh, determined to. Uh, well, this, go, go this down with the ship, I guess. This may be a sidelight here, but I want to take a. Uh, uh, do a, an identification here and ask you a question about that. Yeah. Uh, you're watching uh, Aware on the Air, uh, presented by the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, uh, Carlos Brook and Ed, Ed Mandel talking about the news of the week, which has uh, yep. certainly been interesting along these lines. Uh, and um, uh, what do you think it means, Ed, as far as the fall elections are concerned? Uh, you suggested a moment ago that you think that, uh, if I understood you correctly, wow. that you think that the uh, uh, Democrats will not do so well uh, by moving against Trump uh, in the fall election. Uh, probably the only place that that has real features of interest is in the House of Representatives. House of Representatives is controlled by the Republicans right now, and there are those suggesting that the uh, demonization of Trump and so forth will lead to a Democratic takeover of the House of Representatives. You think that's going to happen? I don't think so at all. I, 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 th I think right now, I mean, the, the Democrats are doing everything they can to to consider the to to continue Hillary's uh, the Hillary Clinton's by play, strategy of failure. <laughs> Look, I think you're right. No, I, I think this is true. I mean, they're determined to, no matter what no matter what happens to to continue to shoot themselves in the foot and uh, continue to go down. It's like we're going down with the ship. And Just keep shoot, on saying, go faster and faster and faster. Shoot and no, themselves like, in the foot and not out of mere stupidity. There's obviously enough stupidity oh, no, to go around. But to shoot themselves in the foot, that is to destroy their own electoral chances yes. uh, by by insisting uh, on the continuation of the war provocations and the growing inequality that the, pol the policies of the last administration were producing. I truly believe that they still perceive Trump as the host of Celebrity Apprentice. 
Well, uh, he was. <laughs> no, he was. Yeah. But the money, he, even, even right now, they still mm -hmm. that's, that's the way they perceive him, and they, they'll continue until, until until he's out of office, and, and it was it six more years, whatever. It is. <laughs> Demo Democrats, for all they their talk continue. about uh, overcoming discrimination and so forth, uh, really uh, live in the world uh, uh, of, of PLU. Uh, do you know the phrase PLU? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yes, I, I, I mean, it came up in some discussion I was having with some okay. mutual friends of ours not no too problem. long ago. Uh, PLU was a phrase that was used, I'm showing my age here, in my youth by people of a certain uh, social status in this country uh, who would turn up their noses at certain individuals that showed up because they were not people like us. Wow. PLU. Keep them out of here. I mean, those 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 ill-bred, ill-mannered folks who are not down with the program, the who aren't working with it. <laughs> Donald Trump is a perfect example. He's not PLU oh. in the eyes of Hillary Clinton and her friends. Oh. Now, uh, they've covered over that particular notion um, with the attempt of saying that they're speaking for the uh, discriminated against people of color, women, others, so forth, for, uh, refugees, uh, so forth. Uh, they say that, but in fact what we have here, I think, is a PLU culture, a group of people who are appalled uh, that a vulgarian like Donald Trump uh, should have any chance at the presidency, and they're appalled not only because of his challenges to the neoconservative and neoliberal principles of the Obama-Clinton administration, but also because he's just not clubbable. <laughs> he's not uh, uh, club, the, the clubbable people, the people who are allowed into the club, are people who are PLU, people by like way, us. By the way, I would merge, by the way, I, I hate to have to say this because I actually voted for Bush. Um, yeah, you would have, you, I, you, but I'm saying you would have to merge Obama, uh, Clinton, Obama, Bush, and Clinton, and just merge it all together because it, 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 it does seem as if uh, they're all on the point. same agenda. Because I've seen web, uh, uh, episodes where where the Bushes are embracing the Obamas, uh, of course, and we're on the same. They're, they feel as that they, they're on the same page, and they oppose Trump, and they try to do everything that they can. And do that's it. that's worth stressing. It's worth pointing out. So there is there is something there where literally yeah. Trump is is challenging a yeah. lot. Yeah. He's challenging a lot of the past. And it's also worth stressing that our easy distinctions of left and right, Republican and Democrat, are largely meaningless. That those distinctions in the 21st century do not challenge the fact that the policies, uh, economic and military, of both the Bush and Obama administrations are essentially continuous. What they say is different. But the policies don't change. Yeah. Uh, what appalled the political establishment was Trump's threat to change those policies. Mm -hmm. In office, he comes in office and follows the same policies of the Obama and Bush administration for the most part. But when he departs from them, as he did spectacularly this weekend with the uh, uh, deal with North Korea, yes, uh, the political establishment says our worst fears are confirmed. This man is not down with the program. He's not PLU. We can't count on him or working in the interest of uh, uh, corporate globalization. Uh, he is not clearly working in interest of the profits of the one percent and covering sin with smooth names. This man has got to go, actually, and that's that's where the political establishment is. Actually, one one friend that Car that that, 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 that uh, Trump has found is Jimmy Carter. I'm glad I forgot what Jimmy Carter said to the effect. I think, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is kind of kind of mm -hmm. bizarre if, if, if most uh, for if Republicans or conservatives to say that, but. Uh, but uh, apparently Jimmy Carter has been supportive of Trump, and I guess he wants a, he feels like Trump deserves to be a, to win a Nobel Prize. Or anything. Well, yeah. Car Carter is an interesting figure amongst yeah. the recent presidents because, of course, it was in his administration that neoliberalism essentially took over. Yep. Uh, and Carter came on as someone who was appalled by it in terms of his public pronouncements. Uh, but instituted it in terms of this practice of his presidency. Yeah. The only difference between uh, Carter and his successors is that Carter was embarrassed 
by this contradiction. Uh, his successors dwelt on the contradiction, uh, uh, happily embraced the hypocrisy involved in it. I'm talking about Bush and Obama, uh, and didn't have any trouble following neoliberal policies, meaning more inequality, and neoconservative policies, meaning more war, while pre pro while preaching the opposite. Well, I'm Car it bothered Carter a bit. Well, I'm not going to be so completely supportive of Jimmy Carter. I'm uh, not. I'm not I, supportive. I, I, I will just say that, 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 that oddly enough, that Jimmy Carter is actually one of one of Trump's few friends. Well, it's because of the because he was aware of the contradiction. <laughs> didn't, I think. Didn't, didn't see that coming. And it's become more aware after. I mean, since Carter, look. Carter's lived long enough yeah, well, to uh, withdraw from some of the positions he took. Take to, to the matter of Israel. Yeah. Uh, uh, Carter has criticized more than any uh, living ex-president um, the crimes committed by the state of Israel. Uh, now, in office, he supported Israel, as all presidents have, uh, but the uh, honesty, if that's what it is, um, of his position after leaving the White House has led him to point out uh, the very real crimes uh, that the U.S. covers over uh, when they're committed by Israel. Uh, just, uh, okay. Uh, if his notion of the afterlife is right, he may have uh, <laughs> saved himself, huh? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, so, let's see now. Where, where do you want to go as far as? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's, uh, well, it's, I, I was going to talk a little yeah. uh, about the um, uh, international conferences that took place leading up to the conference in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, particularly the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, and the. Uh, uh, St. Petersburg Economic Conference and the one in Astana, all of which occurred within the last couple of weeks, and all of this, all of which point up the uh, 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 increasing integration of Eurasia over against the American demand that Eurasia be open to American imperialist. Uh, uh, exploitation, uh, which, as I say, has been the case since the end of the 19th century. Would you say it was a good move on Trump's part to renegotiate some of these trade treaties that, 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 were, that were approved by previous administrations, to renegotiate them, and uh, they're, they're, they're different than NAFTA and they're, they're different... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the short answer is yes, but the problem is that the renegotiations are going in the wrong direction. Uh, first of all, it's important to see what these uh, tra trade treaties like NAFTA are. These are not um, uh, democratic uh, operations meant to control the economy in the interest of all. Right. Uh, these are um, uh, investors' rights agreements. Uh, which override the laws of the uh, countries, including Mexico and Canada, by the way, uh, that get in the way of corporate profits. Uh, NAFTA and similar trees are an example of corporate globalization mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the uh, exclusion of popular governments uh, from making any uh, 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 pro-citizen Ob, uh, adjustments to the economic circumstances that they describe. So renegotiating them, reestablishing them, even abolishing them mm -hmm. would be a step in the right direction. Uh, the problem is yeah. that the Trump administration is doing it with uh, experts who are uh, perhaps making the situation even worse. That is leaving the corporate entities in control rather than the democratic forces. Um, and I think it's important to see that uh, this last election, uh, the presidential election yes. last time, um, really did show the bankruptcy, uh, sorry about the image, of the uh, left-right distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not a case of the last election uh, being won by the right over against the left, which had been in control. Mm -hmm. That's just not right. That's not the way it was. Um, we came closer to it in the analysis offered by, of all people, Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon, who was Trump's uh, uh, intellectual bodyguard for a while, um, pointed out that the real conflict was between corporate globalization uh, and economic nationalism. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, well, people seized on that word nationalism and say, oh, well, uh, Ben is just a terrible racist. This is not. That's not what he was talking about. What he was talking about was control by the 1%, the corporate structure, the globalization of their control, the worldwide extension of their control on the one hand, and the rights of the majority, uh, the majority of a given nation, uh, to assert some control of their own economic life. That's what he meant by economic nationalism. These say? were the two forces that he, f that he felt were uh, op set opposite to one another in the last election, and indeed around the world. And we do have a name, we do have a name for the insurgency, and it's not left or right, the name is populism. And it's populism that we should be talking about, because that refers to the demand by the majority of control over its economic life over against that elite, which now has the control. And if you doubt the elite has the control, look at the inequality statistics over the last 40 years. Inequality in this country, and indeed around the world, has risen an ex at an accelerating rate over those 40 years. That's not an accident. That's exactly what corporate globalization is meant to do. And what Bannon saw was that there was a revolt against this in various ways around the world, and the revolt could be called economic nationalism, the insistence on the nation, insistence by the nation, by the majority in the nation, that their economic life be attended to. That's, that's, that's the conflict, you, and we can multiply examples through England and France and Germany and the new government in Italy, most notably. Would you say that getting the globalists getting a black eye in the last presidential election was a bad thing? Oh no, I think it was a very good thing. But the problem I mean, is, it Hillary, wasn't done. Hillary Clinton, that would, that speech would have yeah. accelerated the situation. Exactly. Hillary Clinton represented economic globalization, yes. and her defeat by a candidate who, however erratically, yeah. represented economic nationalism, was yeah. a good thing. Capital G, capital T. Yeah. Now. There's all sorts of things to be said about that, including the remarkable tergiversations by, by the Trump administration. They're turning their back on the things and the people that brought them there. Yeah. Well, I can't say that, that Trump is perfect. I, I, I just, <laughs> no. uh, I, I'll just say that he's, he's, way, he's, he's way better than, than, we, we, than Hillary Clinton. Holy smoke. We, we, and the only thing I, I, I think I think that's a, that's a very good thing. In my, my and the opinion. only thing I'd argue with you, with you is how strong that way is. Yeah. The, the economic nationalist position mm -hmm. is indeed the position that should be opposed to corporate globalization. Yeah. Uh, but uh, whether it is being done, whether that's being done, even by the people who say they champion it, uh, that's not clear. Well. You're watching uh, Aware on the Air. We have a few minutes left to uh, uh, turn our attention to a world of troubles. Uh, <laughs> what particularly is left on your list, Ed? Well, I, w I was just going to mention. I'm, 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 I appreciate the fact that, that one thing that, that Trump is it, one issue. I think Trump raised in his, in his presidential election. He continues to raise it to this current to this very day. Is, is the idea of fake news, and I, I it, may, it may it may sound like a, like a tired uh, thing, but I, I I appreciate it because I mean he is, he keeps on he keeps on bringing it up because I mean, it makes us makes you makes you listen to the news and, and challenge it more. Well, and kind of challenge what you hear in the news and rather. Than going along with it docilely and like that, you know, the dust, you know, whatever. It's, it's an interesting point and an important one. Um, yeah. uh, the uh, loss of net neutrality in this country, which seems to have occurred in the last couple of days, yeah. I think is, is in fact quite a bad thing, but it is a, uh, a, a peculiar matter. I mean, I'm old enough to recall the opposition of the Vietnam War and the way in which that formed and how the media universe in which that formed changed and was changed by that opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, it was peculiar and it's different from what we have now. Certainly there is an advantage to the growth of um, uh, as it were, decentered media. The fact that you can get your information from the web from sites that you would not otherwise find influencing the New York Times or the Washington Post and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's true and that's good, uh, but the problem is what leaves us with a situation in which people for the most part listen only to the things they agree with and exclude everything outside of that as fake news. Yeah. Uh, now it seems to me that we need a 
in this media universe, we need uh, tools of intellectual self-defense uh, stronger than the ones we're using right now. We're being jerked around by media of all sorts from the Washington Post and New York Times at one side to mad websites on the other side to various and sundry positions in between. And instead of having a uh, discussion in which these various positions are meant to are necessarily meant to confront one another. Uh, positions that don't agree with the one that you start with uh, ends up being thrown out as fake news. I think that's dangerous. I'd much prefer to see some real debates on these matters. Uh, and uh, my fear is that that's not happening. That uh, I, I said the other day that the one place in our fair town in which pol opposite political opinions actually seem to confront one another, except our program, of course. Uh, <laughs> the one place in town right. where opposite political opinions seem to confront one where another is, is in the letters column of the News Gazette. <laughs> I said when they print a letter yeah. uh, next to another letter next to another letter. Uh, that's pretty thin. Yes, that's not, mu not much is going on there. Uh, but uh, every time they run one of my letters, <laughs> I think at least something like this is, is, is happening. And that's good. And it points up how it's not happening elsewhere. Which would distress you is the fact that the uh, newspapers or industry is in trouble. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a good so, point. That's so, a good I mean, point. So There's so a that, certain that, residual that, that, quality. That, that is your only thin wall. It's like, yep. wow. Exactly. <laughs> you're, 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 you're pinning your hopes on something. I, that couldn't, on, which I couldn't agree more. Could be big, big trouble here. It's a very thin wall. Yeah. Uh, nowhere near so big as the one Trump wants to build. Yeah. <laughs> or the one behind. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, no, it, 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 it is a problem. I mean, uh, as I look back on all those years to Vietnam, uh, what strikes me is how propagandized the American discussion of politics wa was. Uh, the understanding of American history and the understanding of what the U.S. was and what our country was doing was an amazingly fantasized uh, world, a world that now seems to me um, uh, much more remarkably misrepresented than I even thought at the time. It took a long time to learn that. Well, I get the impression that the Vietnam protesters, or the people who were protesting the, 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 the conflicts back then, were being uh, sabotaged by the uh, by the by the, what is the the CIA effort to to create uh, drugs as being the uh, the way to fight the protest and to keep them drug addled and keep them uh, keep, them, keep them confused with uh, different different uh, you, you, psyops. The biggest the biggest value of drugs in those days, of course, was yeah. an excuse for the police to come in and break up groups right. that might also be thinking about politics. Yes, and we have we have that on the testimony of John Ehrlichman. Yep, you, you're familiar with that. Yep. Uh, so yes, it, it, uh, but I, what I remember. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if there's some of those things that continue to this very day. What I remember from those yeah. days is the way in which, uh, as the as the sentiment grew in the 1960s, mm -hmm. that there was something profoundly wrong with what the U.S. was doing in Southeast Asia. That's uh, I mean, no one believed that in 1965 in a, in, a, in America. No one, mm -hmm. uh, maybe Noam Chomsky, but nobody else. Yeah. Um, the uh, what happened in the next few years was quite a remarkable turnaround so that by the end of the 60s a majority a majority of americans believed that the war in vietnam was not just a mistake that it was a crime mm. that was astonishing i saw that happen and i lived through it uh and uh participated in the sense that I could have told you there was anything much wrong with what was going on in Vietnam in 1965. Which, which um, controlled the, the, uh, the, the fact that it was a three networks back then. How much well, that's part of it. That's Mars. part of it. But I mean, yeah. uh, you know, it was uh, uh, it, the, the, the important thing was the growth of understanding in the American public mm -hmm. that it was being uh, uh, lied to uh, across the board. Yes. Uh, he, as we found out later from things like the Pentagon Papers and so forth, mm -hmm. the American elites knew perfectly well what was going on and knew perfectly well what they were doing in Southeast Asia. They didn't blunder into the Vietnam War, as all American uh, commentators said as a matter of course to the very end of the war. The, uh, theory. <laughs> the, the final judgment of the New York Times on uh, the Vietnam War was that it began as a blundering attempt to do good. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the American, uh, the the American ascendancy, the American intellectual elite, uh, the American establishment knew that was a lie from the beginning. Yeah. What was interesting was to see how that conviction grew amongst the American people mm -hmm. in those years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what happened, a and the other second half of the story, by the way, is the remarkable effort beginning in the 1970s of the American intellectual establishment to reverse that conviction that was arrived at by most Americans. If people are believing that, we have got to do something to make sure that they don't continue to think that way. That was called the Vietnam Syndrome. The Vietnam Syndrome was the belief that the U.S. was not fully justified in the wars that it was carrying out around the world. The Vietnam Syndrome was the view that the war in Southeast Asia was a crime, not a mistake. The Vietnam Syndrome was the real object of the wars of the first Bush administration, as George Bush the first said in so many words. So, After the success of the first Gulf War, George Bush said publicly, the most important thing is that we've kicked the Vietnam Syndrome so in bring, the head. Bring, so bring us up to this current day, before, if in the last, few, last couple of minutes here of the show here, uh, the, the idea that, I mean, even now the American people are trying being deceived by the media oh, yes. to believe all sorts of lies. Absolutely. And, and, absolutely, and, and fake news of, of, of Russian collusion, which even Coleman doesn't, doesn't, doesn't even believe in anymore. Precisely. So literally, so literally I mean, fake news continues to the this very day, uh, this distortion of, of reality continues to this very day, you know, whether it's uh, there are different conflicts or different uh, different ways of perceiving the, the world. You're absolutely far, right. Far uh, you have been watching Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. In the 24th week of 2018, another week in which the world can see that the most extensive global terrorism is U.S. worldwide war making. My thanks tonight to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research, C. No's notes on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air, along with articles referred to tonight. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Leggett and Ethan Young and Andrew Scholarly, thanks to whom also this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. AWARE will meet this coming Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m. at Hammerhead Coffee, University Avenue and Wright Street in Campus Town. The meetings are open. Open, come and join us and talk about what can be done in terms of opposing American war making in our own town. Finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about but Americans don't, Manning, Assange, Snowden and others, truth-tellers persecuted by the U.S. government. Now, this is Carl Esterbrook for Ed Mandel, I think. Karen Aram, Karen Evans-Levy, Stuart Levy, David Green, and other members and friends of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck.